Hello, business analysts from Tampa and elsewhere. Welcome to our 65th, I think, class um, of the Tampa IIBA Certification Study Group. Our fabulously fearless facilitator is feeling fairly foul today. So Cliff and Yuli and I will stumble through this thing the best we can. So we've been, um, been talking about chapter six. We um, did the question twice last week. We just uh, chucked that uh, look at the book directly. The first half of the chapter this week, we'll finish it off um, with the back half, and hopefully we'll have enough of an understanding of this somewhat difficult material, and we'll be able to move forward. So... Um, the chapter's mission is to support uh, business analysts with networking and instruction and team building and general education. Um, we definitely uh, want to get people certified and support their efforts to do that. Um, my main concern is always to ensure, regardless of certification, that you were the best possible analyst you can be. Um, we have a number of links here. Um, Cliff has helpfully provided them in the comments. Um, these are all the websites you can go to for past meeting recordings, the uh, meetups, the IIBA um, sites, and everything else. We have pages on LinkedIn and Facebook where uh, Cliff is the king of marketers and uh, keeps everyone very well informed as to meetings and activity. We've uh, gone through a lot of material. We've gone through all the sections in the book once, and then we did a series of um, on the techniques, and then we did a professional series based on different rules people have and uh, now we're taking a second pass through the sections of the Baba. Uh, we are currently working on the fourth week of chapter six. The questions kind of were goofy from Watermark, so we've uh, taken a different tack here the last two weeks. Um, if you want to use Watermark Learning's uh, uh, study materials, um, you can use this code that Thea arranged um, for a discount. And the chapter is run by a number of people, including our fearless leader, Cliff, who is on the call and making sure everything is working behind the scenes. Um, Thea is our normally intrepid facilitator. She is sadly not with us this week. We are soldiering on in her absence. Let's make her proud. Um, the board always needs new members, so let Cliff or Thea or somebody know if you're interested in helping out. These are um, random things uh, that we need to do and need help with on the fly the by. Um, so the reason these uh, um, meetings are able to count for study credits for certification 
and also PDUs or CDUs or whatever the sort calls them, is because Yulia and I uh, participate, we are certified. Um, there's a lot of information here um, on websites, on LinkedIn. Feel free to ping either of us. We'd love to help out answering questions. Um, just trying to clarify things in your mind. In particular, um, asking me questions is always helpful because it sometimes inspires me to write new web posts about things that um, are of interest. If you have a question, probably a lot of other people have it too. Um, Yulia, earned her certification only about five months ago. So the whole test taking process is still very fresh in her mind and her um, contributions to the discussions we have are always fabulous. Um, Tish Bell is a buddy of Thea. She also, um, earned a certification late last year. So um, things are happening with the chapter. Our uh, work here is um, proven to be somewhat constructive. And I think that is it for those slides. So um, does anyone have to... Um, any comments before we get to Jordan? Hey, Bob. <clears throat> yeah, um, Jim here. So um, in the last meeting, um, I brought up kind of a curiosity, a question. Um, in the watermark learning, it, in addition to the 10 stakeholders and the one invisible stakeholder, which is our business analyst, um, the, the book talks about um, tasks which are assigned to any stakeholder and tasks which are assigned to all stakeholders. And so I did my research. I've got a little grid that I can show you, and it might sort of help a discussion on that little little question of um, where those fall. Um, if you'd That's like to see fantastic. it. Fantastic. Would you like to share your screen? Sure. Okay. I will unshare and take it away. All right. Let's see here. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, over here on the left, um, I've mapped the, the various knowledge areas and all of the tasks. Over on the right, you can see all of the stakeholders that get involved with each task. And in these two columns here and here in watermark, they indicate any stakeholder and all stakeholders. And they don't always map to these X's they have in their grid, um, which is an interesting inconsistency. Um, but what I was pondering was when would, what's what's the literal difference between any stakeholder and all stakeholders? So let's filter for a moment on any stakeholder. There are only four tasks in the series that relate to any stakeholder. It's conduct a licitation, manage stakeholder collaboration, specify model requirements, and define requirements architecture. So that seems kind of interesting and random. And you can see that these are sporadic, the X's across the stakeholder grid. So let's look at all stakeholders for a moment. And I kind of think this is splitting hairs, but it, then I thought, oh, well, maybe, maybe there is something to this. When I saw this, all stakeholders involved with verify requirements and validate requirements. So what that tells me, and let's see if people agree, is that you can go to any number of stakeholders to gather information and requirements. 
but you can't validate and verify the requirements until you've presented the individual inputs from everyone and given them out to the entire group of people that need to be that are, are going to be affected by the change. And I think that's kind of, I don't know, that's my interpretation of any versus all stakeholders. Is that does that ring true? I think um and uh well, first of all, um, does anyone else have any comments before I throw my two cents in? Well, that part sounds logical because you could go out and gather requirements from almost anybody. Mm -hmm. But to verify and validate and the people that are paying for it and everything else, yeah, it makes sense you have all the stakeholders there. Is this a treasure map? <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. Wow, <laughs> this is crazy. Look at how beautiful this is. Very, really nice, sir. Like it came out really good. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, 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 I've set these maps up as my own tests, and my assignment is every so often I go through and I blank out this map, and I go back and put the X's in, and I see which ones I get right. Nice. Um, so nice. it scores me and it helps me kind of keep track and sort of, I also look for patterns like, like, oh, look at this one. It's all the way across. It's, it, it's, it's all the X's here. The defined change strategy, which I thought was interesting. Um, Very innovative, though, extremely, really innovative. Have you um, cross-checked this across when it actually says in the Babylon? Not yet. I've, I've actually taken this information from the watermark study guide, though, um, to make sure that that each of these rows were correctly assigned according to that. But, you know, if anyone wants to volunteer, I'm willing to publish this entire, you know, all of my little pattern maps of of, you know, stakeholders to tasks, everything. And we if we want to have an offline group that wants to validate the results and <laughs> we could do that. I would ask you to um, make that available to Cliff and he can put it in the chapter share drive. I think it's terrific information. Yeah. Somebody went through a lot of trouble to think about that. You've obviously spent a lot of time reviewing it. Um, I think anything that makes you think about the material and take it apart at a granular level like this is helpful. Um, mm. I don't know how fabulous it's going to be um, for taking the actual exam, but for thinking about how to do the actual work, I think it's great. Mm, can I read something from the book, for example, chapter seven, right? 7.1 7. Yeah. and 7.2. In 7.1, we have any stakeholder, and 7.2, we have all stakeholders, right? Uh, I'm not going to read everything, but it says business analyst may choose. Um, okay, I will go to the end of the sentence. Uh, so they might choose to invite some or all stakeholders to participate in this task. Some or all stakeholders to participate in this task. And 7.2, it says there are four all stakeholders could be involved in these tasks. So it could be the difference is just language that all literally means all and any <coughs> could be some or all. That makes sense. Could it be Let just language? Me, um, share one other thing. Could you unshare for a moment? Oh, sure. So can you see this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, moving screens around like uh, Johnny Cash. 
he said he has to change harmonicas faster than kids and duck. Um, so here's all the phases you go through in a project or an engagement. And I've walked here through this um, a few times before. So that's kind of a streamlined and stylized version of it. And that's how all those phases uh, work in different management styles. But in general, um, you can think about um, there being an iterative um, uh, elicitation and review process in every phase. And these match up pretty well with what the bat box says. Um, the bat box says it um, broken up differently, but all these phases are identified and discussed. And you can think about um, what's going on in each of these phases and think about who might be involved. So when you're verifying and identifying requirements, that is here. And obviously, everybody can be involved in that. And that makes sense. When you're doing conceptual model, which is um, uh, doing discovery, finding out what's going on now, doing the as is, talking to the subject matter experts, um, talking to the implementation experts to um, find out what technologies we might think about um, that can contribute to a solution. That'll drive who participates in this, but in every phase, we always have a verification and validation step. We're always talking we're always learning, we're always presenting things, and we're always reviewing iteratively until we come to agreement. So that actually happens not just with requirements, it happens with all the work we do. And obviously, some practitioners are better in some phases than others. Um, some will be involved in all, some won't. Um, that's just another way to think about it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it's a very organic creature. <laughs> yeah. Process. And like I said, um, all of, uh, you may find that the uh, the mapping is like the techniques to the um, uh, knowledge areas, the six knowledge areas, and each subsection thereof. Um, prob um, the bat box says one thing: is that the last word? Can you think of an exception? Of course you can. So it's just a uh, way to, um, if you get the general concept and understand the whole racy concept, you'll be in a great space for thinking about things, Tom. Definitely share that with Cliff and he can share it. Um, I hope people will look at it and think about it further and uh, talk to Jim and bring things up in future meeting. Anyone else before we move on? Okay, um, so here is the overview of the um, entire um, chapter six. We've talked about um, section six, one and six, two before. Can you see the Babak there? Yep. Okay, let me move these screens around again. 
Um, Thea does this very gracefully. I don't know how she does it. Make sure you appreciate her when she comes back. So what we talked about before was figure out what's going on now, find out the as is, and then figure out the to be. And once we've done that, we um, assess the risk. That's the next thing we'll talk about of uh, both the to be state and the transition methodology. So one thing I thought about uh, when I reviewed this in preparation for tonight is um, you actually define um, the change strategy, which is how you get from one to two, right? Limited rollout tests, um, trial users, and things like that. And that's also part of the risk. So yeah, I think you have to think of six, three, and six, four happening iteratively, right? And um, so six, three will apply to both the solution that you identify in six, two, and the um, method of getting there you talk about in 6.4. So it's not directly linear. So let's go to chapter or section 6.3. All right. So what do we mean? Uh, does anyone want to read out the inputs and comment on them? Don't be bashful. You talk better than I do. Um. So the inputs are influences, uh, elicitation results, designs, requirements, business objectives, and potential values. Um, I don't have a lot as far as information about them. I'm just starting to read the books. Um, influences are internal and external influences and elicitation results. I don't really know too much about the business objectives are those in which you're um, trying to get your business from the starting point up to the future state of what you want it to be. And the potential value is uh, the outcome or, or what you're going to receive from moving from point A to point B. Sounds like a great start. Um, so anything can be an influence, obviously. Elicitation results, and remember these are confirmed as what the as is, and also what are the requirements. Those are things you would elicit from the customer. So if you remember the um page diagram I showed with all the iterative loops in it. There's actually the first phase is kind of the problem statement or the intended use. And that's where you identify the actual uh, business objective. What's the overall problem? Then you get into the weeds and um, that's different. Uh, the requirements all need to address that and the designs. So they're more detailed. Um, I think uh, if we remember the talk we had from the enterprise architect who talked about doing work in three layers, so the top layer was business. I think that's what 6.2 is trying to address. 
And um, the middle layer is the abstract or application layer. And that's where you define activities and um, variables and data items and um, um, calculations that you do and rules that you impose. Those are all abstract and logical. And then the way you actually um, implement those in some sort of working system, whether it's an IT system or um, people dealing with paper or any other object or information or any combination thereof, that's at the lower level. And requirements and designs can address those two lower levels. The potential value is always um, in terms of money and convenience and um, um, satisfaction of the workers and customers. Does that make sense? So yep. we're always trying to fold the concepts um, that we've talked about before into everything we do to make um, so we can see how it's all um, cross-linked and associated. Anyone want to read off and discuss the guidelines and tools, some of which I touched on? And it seems some of these guidelines and tools are outputs of other tasks. Right. Current state description, right? And future state description. Yeah, stakeholder engagement approach, business analysis mm -hmm. approach, change yeah. strategy. So basically what is not output business policies as in on its own identified risks on its own too. So these all tend to be nouns. We differentiated this uh, from techniques last week, right? These are all documents and rules and their outputs of things you do, but they're things that exist and rather than things you do. So that's the differentiation, I would think. Um, and then you obviously get the results of the risk analysis. Um, can someone go ahead and read out the um, output test and make any comments you'd like on them? So for outputs on this, um, one thing I noticed was on 4.5, manage stakeholder collaboration. That's something that happened early, uh, earlier in the book in chapter 4.5. So I think this expresses the iterative nature of all of these. It's not a linear path. Some of these are refining these, the, the managed stakeholder collaboration. Um, and some of these go forward into other, other processes, it looks like. A defined change strategy. That makes sense. That's the next task. Uh, 7.6, analyze potential value and recommend solution. Um, and that is in the next chapter at the, that's the final part of RAD, um, requirements analysis and design definition, correct? So, um, that's kind of interesting because we're in a chapter that's talking about strategy and at the and our next task is going to be define the change strategy. Um, so maybe I might get confused sometimes between what happens in the strategy um, chapter and what happens in risk analysis and design where you actually recommend the solution, um, kind of keeping in mind 
the the goal of each task or knowledge area. Um, analyze. Oh, this, Go ahead. Yeah, this um, task is assess risks, right? Yeah. So when we assess risks, our output would be risk analysis results, whatever we come up with. And this output can be used and should be used in managed stakeholder collaboration, define change strategy, and et cetera, we see on the screen. So when you, I mean, logically, right, uh, when we define change strategy, we need to know the risks. That's why we use output of assess risks which is our analysis uh, to define change strategy. We were looking at, uh, at this before like this, or before, at first I confused that this managed the code collaboration and define change strategy is output of assess risks. For a, for a second, I got confused. I don't know if you, you, you had the same. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see that where the risk analysis comes into play um, for defined change strategy, it also comes into play to recommending a solution um, and making sure that I keep in my head those the difference between six four and seven six. Yeah, I mean, when we recommend solution, we need to know the risks, right? Right, right. So there, like I said before, there are potential risks associated with both the um, solution itself and also the process of rolling out or implementing the solution and changing over to it. Which is the change strategy. That makes sense. So in reality, everything you do carries some risk. So in the, sorry, in the first slide, I showed you where I had all these steps. I had uh, um, um, simplifications, limitations, and risk and impact. And that's actually fairly far forward. Um, that's just one way of thinking about things. In reality, um, risk is always part of the iterative analysis. And another way to think about that is you're always iterating within each phase, but you're iterating back and forth between phases as well. So you never um not only are you um, coming to a more complete understanding of all the bits as you're working through them, you want to make them all consistent. Um, if you think about their requirements, traceability matrix um, through time, and um, you, uh, you can always have people operating in different phases. So um, this is a good general way of thinking about how to include risk analysis in the process. So as always, there's a general thing you want to think about in a very specific knowledge of what the BAP, uh, BAP box says uh, so you can pass the exam. Yeah, William has a question. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, I think that's a, a great point that you make, Robert. Um, you know, having worked on many projects with different methodologies, uh, I think this is really applicable, at least to me, in my experience, uh, when you're working on an iterative or an agile or a rad type project, um, there are different teams that are engaged in early work and they may even prototype very early on, uh, right in the requirements phase actually, and build screens. For example, we find that pretty, pretty effective when it's difficult to get requirements out of someone who really doesn't understand what they want. But uh, if they can look at screens and they can see uh, text information, they can see images, then it really helps them focus on what it is they want. 
from that, uh, you typically get to some prototypical design, which has some assumptions made about that design. And then as you're going through other requirements and other phases, because you typically prioritize at least um, certain strategies do, the most risk or highest risk requirements first, and then other requirements, lower risk requirements second. When you start going through those lower requirements, you may find that something that you've put into your prototype you need to go back and reassess because of new information that you're getting. And so I think that's where that 706 and that 8.4 come in is mm -hmm. because you may have already gone through in a first pass and done some of that work. And now you come back with another set of requirements and someone gives you some new information, another SME who happens to have more information or better insight that makes you want to go back and reassess that. Excellent comments. Um, all right, let me share something different just for a second. And expanding on that, William, that I would call that an endless loop. So you need a good PM to manage that process or you can end up in a circle forever. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, here's um, the way I think about uh, keeping everything logically consistent through all the phases. So you'll start, and this is very abstract. You may only have one intended use, which is a business need. Um, and you'll find out many, many things about what's going on um, and they should all map to the um, intended use. And then you'll map the requirements, everything in the requirement um, should map to what's going on now in the business need. And same with design, implementation and test. You may have many to one and one to one and one to many relationships going um, uh, left to right through the process. And at any time you're in any process, you may add to or modify something in a previous process to keep this all complete. So that's another way of thinking about um, how you um, iterate back and forth and within each phase. And uh, I have these question marks here showing that things can be added anywhere at any time going backwards. So that just highlights again what William said. And back to the Babak. Yeah, we have a comment from Tamara for a question. What if it disappeared for a second? What if you, the business analyst and the project manager, disagree on the main risks to address uh, to address first and seem to have different opinions on how a project should be implemented? That is just human nature, and the organization has to figure out how to break ties. So it may be the customer will decide, maybe a senior manager or sponsor will decide. Um, uh, maybe it's just understood that there is a decision maker and uh, it's at the end of the day, we're all just humans doing the best we can with all the wonderful qualities we have and also sometimes the foibles. So you try to do it in the most friendly, cooperative, customer helping way possible. And we know that always isn't possible, and we deal with that the best we can. Does that make sense? 
Yes, thank you. All right, great question. Um, rather than um, go through all the individual pages, I'll invite you to read this. Um, let's do the same exercise uh, with the um, diagram in section six form. So now we're defining how we're going to get from one to two. It's defining the change strategy, how we get from the as is to the to be. And the way I think about it is the requirements are an abstract form of the to be, the um, design, that we do um, the actual proposed solution that's a concrete form of the to be and the actual implemented state is the to be, if that helps anything. So again, I'll ask for a volunteer to read off the inputs and add any commentary you'd like. I'll read them. Um, how about, so I, I think this makes a lot of sense to me in that this is very linear. Um, you take your stakeholder engagement approach to figure out, to just know, hey, who's going to make decisions and, and how are we going to approach um, defining a change strategy um, and who to engage. And then you take the input from the last three steps in this chat, in this knowledge area your current state, your future state, and your risk analysis, and you figure out what's the best way to get from current to future state, um, given the risks. And I think if I understand it correctly, that you're actually kind of accounting for possibly um, the, you may have several chain strategies and you weigh the risks and then you, determine what's the best one that's going to meet the business objectives. Um, and what you come out with is uh, the change strategy, but you also have to remember, you're gonna come out with a solution scope. And that's, that's kind of interesting here because this is defined change strategy, but we need to know that we're also going to define the solution scope. So that, is that that makes sense. Uh, one thing I think is a little squirrely about the way the bat box does things is um, it has a different way it thinks about providing value or marching through a process. Um, so um, it talks about strategy analysis. So you have your need and solutions go. And then it's requirements analysis and design. So that's in the same order that I think about. Um, then you start doing implementation and testing and rollout. So it's all there. It's just the way they're breaking them down in these chapters is to be um it's all there. It's just a little bit confusing, I think. But you're marching through all this and they're actually talking about the risk and the implementation plan before they really um, discussed in detail where it is you're getting to, what the requirements are, what the designs are. So I think this is a potential area of confusion in the bat box that could be a little clearer if it was uh, expressed a slightly different way. Again, all the pieces are here. It's a fabulous document put together by a lot of smart, dedicated people. Um, and the more eyeballs we put on it, the uh, more we can clarify it and how to think about it. 
Uh, is that helpful at all? It is, and I think I think one of the things that this helped me with is um, if we're looking at the elements in here, if we go to element point two, gap analysis um, in the in the process. Um, in the past, I've I've struggled with what that meant, kind of on the street language that you people use, and I've heard it used in different contexts. Um, and in here, it talks about identifying the differences between current and future state capabilities, and then um, helping to identify the gaps that prevent the enterprise from meeting needs and achieving goals. And so um, analyzing those capabilities in a gap analysis, um, it, it really kind of helps us understand what might get in the way of accomplishing the goals um, using the strategy that we're defining or recommending. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a nebulous term that can apply to many situations. So there can be gaps in the proposed solution in the requirements in our knowledge of the current state in our change strategy. I remember, um, this is very nerdy, so I apologize ahead of time, but um, I used to play d d back in college, back in the Stone Age, and they used the word level for like five different concepts. It's the power of a character, the difficulty of a dungeon, um, the power of a spell, that kind of thing. And it's one word that tries to express many concepts. And gap analysis is a tricky word like that because there can be gaps in everything. It's like Sylvester Stallone, um, said to Polly in the first Rocky movie, she got gaps, I got gaps, together we build gaps. And so that's what we're always doing is trying to fill the gaps wherever they occur. All right. Um, always good to have a little pop culture injection into the proceeding. Um, does anyone want to read off the guidelines and tools and offer some comments? I, I think Desiree has a question before. We... Oh, please. Um, I can read them and then I can ask my question. Um, so the guidelines and tools, business analysis approach, design options, solution recommendations. Um, so the last diagram we looked at, the inputs from that. So mostly like everything I kind of understood was covered. But why for the defined change strategy would they take away business policies? I guess um, because, well, that, that get, that's a great question. So that goes into um, the order of talking about um, how we're going to get from A to B before we've really defined what B is. So we've already looked at business policies in terms of um, the assess risk state and analyze current state and define future state. That should be an input to all those. And here we're um, looking at a, kind of the output of all that uh, define how we're gonna get from A to B. So, <clears throat> The business analysis approach is how we're going to do the work, how we're gonna talk about everything, who we're gonna talk about it with and what order we're gonna do things in. So um, we figured out the as is the design options or 
the um, concrete to be in the solution recommendations or the um, actually implemented to me. So you don't need to uh, describe that explicitly because it's already baked into those um, guidelines and tools. That's the way I think about it. Thank you. That makes sense. All right. Um, who wants to take a shot at uh, reading the outputs for change strategies? Just the um, left hand box. Are we talking about tasks using this output? Is that yes. what you'd like someone to read through? Right. The dark blue on the left-hand side, there were 10 of them. So here we're looking at the plan stakeholder engagement, uh, prioritize requirements, assess requirements, changes, approval requirements, assess risks, uh, define design options, measure solution performances, analyze performance measurements, and assess solution limitations and assess enterprise limitations. And I think that all of this falls back to the first part, which is plan stakeholder engagement, where you get everyone together to look at what the future state is that you have uh, either planned or implemented to see where everyone um, falls in uh, understanding what their roles are, how they feel about this future state to see, you know, if there's anything that needs to be reassessed, to be reevaluated, to change for um, a different option and, um, and to see how that future state benefits all of the stakeholders. And it's also talking about the requirements and the design and the implementation. So that's all part of the strategy, right? How you're going to do all those things, how you're going to coordinate them, how you're going to handle it if you're doing it in waterfall versus agile. Or Maybe you have can, uh, different teams working on things, and they're all um, happening at different times in different phases, and you're in a CI, CD, or continuous integration, continuous deployment situation. Those are all things you need to think about. And then it's always the same activities. Um, they can just be in a different structure that, so that um, leaves a lot of flexibility for you how you do this stuff. Anyone else have anything to uh, comment on on that list? I think it just also reiterates the reiterative qualities of this, given that it goes back to feeding assess risks, which you just got through doing. <laughs> you never assess the risks often enough. Right. So you're always dealing with risk. You're always making things consistent and you're always relating to all the different classes of stakeholders. So they have, uh, they call certain things out um, in specific places in the Babog, but in reality, they're involved all the time. Um, and again, it's what you need to know to pass the test. Um, so uh, who wants to uh, take a shot at the solution scope items? So um, this is 
what is going to be included in the solution? One volunteer, please. I can do it. I don't know how many comments I'll have after, but <laughs> um, prioritize requirements, assess requirement changes, approve requirements, specify and model requirements, validate requirements, define requirements architecture, um, define design options, analyze potential value and recommend solution, measure solution performance, analyze performance measures, assess solution limitations, assess enterprise limitations, and recommend actions to increase solution value. Oh, <laughs> Does that make sense to you? And I'd also ask you to look at what's the same and what's different uh, between those two lists. So um, the change strategy is about how we're doing things and solution scope is what we're going to include. I see a lot of overlaps between the two, and then I also see some differences. And I think the hard part is um, some of these questions sort of allude to where are you at in this jungle gym of tasks and um, inputs and outputs and, and without really telling you much about it other than in other words. And I think that's part of what's interesting about the test is um, I find myself saying, where am I at in this model right now? Or where should I be in the model? Yeah? Right. And that's why having a couple of different ways of thinking about things may be helpful. I found uh, when I took the exam, and maybe Ilya will tell you something different, I found these um, uh, Flow charts to be invaluable. That's what I studied. So, um, can you see the blue screen now? Okay. Yes. So, here are all the phases I identify when I talk about how I do business analysis. So, there's a project planning layer or wrapper where we do all the project management stuff that's different from business analysis. The major phases are intended use, um, conceptual model, um, uh, requirements design, implementation, and test, right? And uh, Here's the way the Babbock thinks about it. And so it actually has the six knowledge areas, and we're in this fourth one now. That's what we're talking about. And uh, the way um, the Babbock talks about things. They break things down in different chapters that doesn't they don't flow through um, specific phases the way I think about them. If you notice, um, the heavy X's or mappings of uh, my phases to the um, bat box kind of sections, the way they've broken it down. And it's uh, still a little bit iterative, but the path still goes from upper left to lower right. So you're still doing everything in the same order. And if you understand that, um, the bad bug is still telling you a story 
As Thea points out, the IIBA is very, very big on not giving you, um, not being prescriptive. It doesn't ever want to tell you, do this, do this, do this, do this. So um, in reality, what you're trying to do is memorize all these details in a coherent way um, and understand that you can do everything in every um, any order, any time, but there is an overlying order to it. And if you get that, really, and then you um, solve the problem. So we're about out of time. Um, hopefully, you found this useful, and we have a good understanding of Chapter 6. I don't want to keep you too long um, for our usual um, way that the likes to run things. Does anyone have any comments or questions before we adjourn? Sounds are, good, Bob. Thanks for filling time. in. <laughs> All right. And what are we stu uh, studying next time? Uh, are we going to chapter seven next time? Yeah, I think yes. so. Okay, cool. Unless um, anybody has a um, um, objection, we've beaten chapter six to death. <laughs> if we don't get it by now, um, you know, who knows? Um, at some point, you have to uh, move on. But I think this is very interesting. It's sort of the glue that holds everything else together. All right, guys, thanks for showing up. We'll have the recording out shortly and you can always reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Bye-bye.